easiest way to stay connected with First Christian is through our Church Center app. On the homepage, you can watch a message, submit a prayer request, give directly online, and even sign up to serve. On your personal dashboard, you'll find any events you're registered for, as well as any life groups or volunteer teams you're a part of. On Sundays, you can easily print name tags and check your children into their class or nursery. You can also opt into our new directory where you can fill out as little or as much information about your household as you like. All of our events are available in the app and easy to register for right from your phone. You'll also have access to Right Now Media, which is a free library full of Bible studies, Christian media, and even shows for kids. You can access past sermons here as well. The Church Center app is available on Android and iPhone for free. We do want to make sure that you know about the Church Center app. It's really pretty cool. There's lots of things. I find myself going there quite a bit. So um, I would encourage you to, to click on that QR code. If you don't have the Church Center app yet, click on it and, and try it out and see all the different things that you can find out about the church, different things that are events that are going on. Easy, easier way to check your kids in on the way to church, and then you just scan your phone. It's really pretty cool. So, uh, so try that out. I encourage you to go there. Also, if you are newer, newer, we'd encourage you to, to uh, fill out one of the connection cards in the chair in front of you and take that back to the connection point or to someone wearing a lanyard uh, as they greet you this morning. Uh, also, we're going to have a time of communion here in a little while, and uh, the communion is over by the doors, and you can pick that up. You can, if you forgot, that's fine. You can go pick it up now. That's all right. And then uh, also, we want to make sure that you know that as we worship, as we as we come to the Lord, there is a way that we can continue to worship, and that's by giving. And, and there's three ways you can do that. You can send uh, a gift to that text number. You can uh, fill out, maybe you came today with a check or, or whatever. You can put that in an envelope, put it in one of those black boxes back in the back. Or you can go on our website to give as well. So lots of different ways to be involved, to be connected in the life of the church. And uh, we're glad to be able to have those ways to do that. Let's stand together. I don't know where you came from this morning, what, what kind of mind frame you came into this room with. But let's slow down and let's, let's worship the Lord together. Let's begin to sing. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Filled with His glory, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus
just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch i feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Oh, just one touch, I feel the power. touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do there's nothing that our God can't do there's not while we can't break through we'll praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like his power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. I will believe for greater things.
we lost the awe. We try to make church comfortable and familiar, and that's good, but in doing so, have we lost the awe? Have we lost the awe of singing to a holy God? Have we lost the power in knowing we sing to the creator of the universe? Let's stop for just a moment and read about what worship is like in heaven from Revelation chapter 4. It says, day after day, night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. We are currently joining in with other voices to sing praises to the Lord Most High, to the glory of God. Let's sing together now.
is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest, your name Good to see everyone. You've probably heard the song by John Denver, Almost Heaven. Let me try to bring it to your mind real quick, okay? Country roads take me home to the place I belong. How does it go next? West Virginia. There we go. Uh, West Virginia actually has a state slogan, Almost Heaven you know, in, in tribute to, to this song. And I've never been to West Virginia. I re- you might be from there and really love it. But I really hope that heaven is more than just a little better than West Virginia. If it, that's all it is, maybe we should relook at the other place <laughs> Uh, just saying, but uh, why is that? You know, uh, everyone gets heaven wrong. Why, when you think of heaven, are you, maybe not all of you, but at times, why does it sound so boring? Like, what do we, I mean, movies make it look so boring, right? I don't think I would ever want to wear white all day, you know, sit in clouds and play harps. You know, I mean, all the movies get it wrong. They make it look so, so, so boring. But what we're going to do today in part two of this series that we're calling A Better Place, uh, as we continue our honest conversation about heaven, hell, and right here, right now, we're going to try to imagine heaven. We're going to try. And as we try to imagine heaven, I want you to understand that there is no description that we're going to be able to give it that's going to do it justice. And so together today, we're going to look at uh, a, a large section out of Revelation. Revelation 21, uh, verses 1 through 8, and then we'll come back at the end of the chapter, and then we'll move into Revelation 22. And the reason why we're looking at, at this text is because, because this is the best picture given of what heaven is like. 
And we're going to do our best to try to understand it because Jesus is actually giving John, remember the, the disciple John, as he's, you know, on Patmos, an island, he's a prisoner, and all the Christians just before 100 AD are going through intense persecution and suffering and public disgrace. And so this vision revelation is given to John for two reasons. The first reason is to encourage, to encourage those who are going up against intense persecution, to remind them that, hey, one day there's going to be great vindication from God and victory for you. It might feel like hell right now, but heaven is coming. And the other reason that revelation was given to John was to warn anybody who was not following Jesus, especially those who had said they were following Jesus. And so we're going we're gonna to get into uh, you know, John's description of what he saw, and we're going to answer three questions together. We're going to answer what is heaven, why do we need it, and how do we get there? What is heaven, why do we need it, and how do we get there? Now, maybe you've Maybe you've seen at some point, uh, you know, a YouTube video or something on social media of like, you know, uh, you know a one or a two-year-old who is almost blind or has severely Im impaired hearing. And then you see the scene where they put like the, the hearing aids in the ears or they put the, the glasses on the eyes and you just see a complete shift in their countenance, right? Because... The, for, for all the years of their life, they sort of knew mom and dad. They sort of heard them or, or maybe could, could vaguely make them out. But the moment that those glasses were put on or the hearing aids were put in, there was this euphoric just peace, this joy. Because finally they see and finally they hear what they always knew was there. And so as we... Uh, unpack Revelation 21, that's a little bit about like what's happening right now. It, is we're putting, we know God is there. We know that there's a place after this place. And so what we need to do is we need the glasses to be put on and we need the hearing aids to be put in. And when we finally get there one day, it'll be that euphoric moment. But we're going to try to do that a little bit today because when we understand and we see and experience what we're reading about, it's going to be the most comforting, the most euphoric, the most pleasurable thing you will ever, ever, ever experience. So Revelation 21, verses 1 and following. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And so John is getting this immediate picture of heaven. And then for the next several verses... All the way through verse 21, we start to get some of the materials that go into making up heaven. And you start to, 
to measure out the length of heaven, and it's 1,400 miles long. It's a city, a 1,400-mile-long city. You have to imagine that. And then we, we are get, we're showing things like precious stones and gold to show us that it's, it's a perfect place because it's in the dimensions of a cube, which were the dimensions of the Holy of Holies, which is where the presence of God was. And it's built with all the best materials to give us the understanding that this place is built perfectly and it's built to last and it's different than this place. Verse 22 picks up. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me, this is chapter 22, then the angel showed me the river of water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. They will there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And I love this last part. And they will reign forever and ever. Do I need to preach anymore? So what is heaven? Well, based on that vision, heaven is a better place. It's the best place. It's the best environment for a human being to be in. It's the best possible human experience. That's what that place is. And we have to notice early on in this revelation in, in chapter 21, notice heaven is coming down. It's not we're going there. It's coming to us. And all of this is being remade. New. New. And better. You heard the phrase, no longer there will be any sea. What does that mean? Well, well, that means sea was a representation in the ancient world for chaos and winds of delusion and deceit. And so what, what, what John is saying is there's no longer any chaos. Chaos is done. Confusion is done. Now imagine all the places that you've visited in your life. You could probably think of a few that you would imagine this is the best possible place I could be. Maybe it's a mountain view for you. Maybe for you it's a, a sunset on the beach. Maybe for you it's on a boat in the middle of a lake on a weather day like it is today. Maybe for some of you it's the best resort where you get all the pampering and everything's perfect and you know they put mints on the pillows, like what, whatever it is. Maybe for you, you just like your house, like you really like your den. You have it all set up. You get all your technology and your comfortable chair and your books and whatever. Um, you, just imagine the, all the places you visited, okay? Now imagine all the best experiences you've ever had in this present place, in this earth. Maybe for you, you think about the birth of a child. What a moment to see life coming from, for me especially, coming from my wife and watching all of my kids be born. Maybe think of your wedding because, because it was, you're saying I do to the person you want to spend the rest of your life with, and it was just a wonderful time. Maybe you think about the moment you fell in love, and it was just you know, so euphoric. Maybe you think about a time where you had a big accomplishment, or maybe there was a really special moment. Let me just say this. All those places and all those experiences are only a foretaste. They are a hint 
They are a glimpse of what you will feel and what you will experience in heaven. Because heaven is a better place. It's the best possible environment. Now, why is heaven a better place? What makes it better? Well, I want to look at seven reasons why heaven is a better place. These aren't the only reasons. These are just some that we can pull from this vision. Heaven is a better place, and this is a very important order here, because evil is removed. Now, if you weren't here last week, I strongly urge you to go online and listen, because we wrestled with the question, how can a loving God send people to an eternity in hell? And part of that conclusion was, you can't have heaven with evil still around. How are you going to have the best possible place unless God judges evil and those who do evil? Now, you notice in chapter 21 here, verse 8, it says evildoers will be judged. They will be cast into the, to the lake. And that's important. And it's sad because we, we, we either are convicted when we read that or we think of people that we don't want them to not be and this better place. But we cannot have heaven if sin is still around. Because in heaven, there's no lying. There's no hating. There's no killing. There's no immorality, which might be why some people don't really want to go there. There's no idolatry. Did you notice in heaven, there's gates, but the gates are never shut? Why is that? Because there's no thieves. The purpose of gates was to protect everybody on the inside from the evils on the outside. But there are no evils anymore. And so the gates are open. There's no need for them because there's no evil in heaven. Heaven is a better place, most importantly, because the problem of evil has been dealt with. It has been done away with. Heaven is a better place because it's a holy place. It's a holy place. 21, chapter 21, verse 2 says, it's a holy city coming down. What does the word holy mean? That's the description that we're given of heaven here. Well, holy literally means separate or set apart or pure. In our best terms, holy is anything other than, than here, you know? It's where God is. It's different. There's no sin it's a holy city because God is there. And holy describes all the places where sin is separated from those places. Now, sin is, is such a significant part of what's going on here and now. See, we have to understand that God created you and I for the Garden of Eden, which if you paid close attention as we read the text, you start to see some of the same elements popping back up, the tree of life and all these sorts of things. We were made for the garden. We were made to live and dwell in a heaven-like atmosphere. That was the vision. We were created for a different place, a holy place, the best possible place for human beings to thrive. But then sin entered into this one. And that caused, well, let me read what Isaiah says in, in 50, chapter, uh, chapter 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins. They've hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So there's a separation. But in heaven, there is no more a separation because of our sin. Chapter 22, verse 3 says, they will see his face. They will serve him. The curse of sin that started in the garden, it's no more. Romans 8, 20 through 22 says, for the creation was subjected to frustration. Talking about what happened in the garden. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. What we have to understand is that we lost heaven. When Adam and Eve 
and you and I to follow, when our relationship with God fell apart because we wanted to be our own God, we wanted to build our own world, we wanted to satisfy ourselves with something outside of him, when our relationship with him fell apart, every other relationship fell apart. What happened when we sinned? We, we began to feel shame and guilt, and that totally affected our relationship with God. But it didn't just stop there. We began to feel things like anxiety and anger, and then our relationship with each other fell apart once sin entered the world. And not only that, our relationship with the whole creation, the whole natural world fell apart because now we began to have struggles with disease and aging and death. You see, don't you understand that when we sinned, it was a choice to separate ourselves, to alienate ourselves from God and his place for us. And once our relationship with God has fallen apart, once we put something else in that place, then every other relationship, our relationship with each other and our relationship with the actual physical natural world, well, they fell apart too. But not in heaven. Heaven, there will be no longer a separation. There will be a coming together. Because heaven, well, it's a better place because it's home. Heaven, did you notice? It's a dwelling, the dwelling of God, where God lives. The dwelling of God is coming down, and we are going to live in it again. Because you and I, we were built to live in the garden. We were built to live in the dwelling of God. What is a dwelling? A dwelling is something that supports and sustains your life. And it supports and sustains your deepest human desires. We were made for a world like that, but we've been separated from that world. What are our deepest desires? Well, our deepest desires, according to Tim Keller, are for love. The experience of love, of true love, and for that love to last. And for us to last. That's what we were made for. And we currently are in a dwelling where there are things like death and sickness and mourning and evil. We live in a dwelling that cannot support and sustain our deepest desire for love and for love to last. Now, Albert Camus, who was a, a writer, a philosopher, he wouldn't call himself that, but in about the middle of the 20th century, and he wrote several books, but, but he, he kind of had this idea that uh, every person in his writings, every person um, seeks, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what background, what part of the world, every person, all of us seek to understand life's purposes. But in a natural world, we are in a natural world that provides no reachable answers. That was what he thought. And so he thought of all of life as this paradox between our impulse, every human being's impulse to ask ultimate questions and the impossibility of achieving any real adequate answers. And so, in other words, we can dream about eternity, we can dream about God, we can dream about higher things, but ultimately we'll never find anything here that will satisfy us with proof that all we are is anything but the combination of molecules that just happen to be here. We're just in a natural world. And so Albert Camus um, decided or ha has advised and, and urges us, once we come to grips with that, so in other words, we must learn to bear an irresolvable emptiness. Yes, you can think about things like heaven. Yes, you can think about things like immortality, but there's nothing of evidence of that here in the natural world. And so for us to thrive, we need to learn to, to just bear with that irresolvable problem. So in other words, just keep telling your spirit every time you start dreaming, every time you start thinking there's something more, every time you start lo longing for love to last. And what you need to do is tell your spirit, hey, just pipe down. Just accept facts. Stop looking for a pie in the sky. The best thing for you is to just cope with the reality. This is a natural world. Just make the best of it. 
And the sooner you learn to be okay with that, the sooner you and I can go on and live the best possible life for ourselves. And he calls this concept the absurd. This place cannot support your deepest desires. And so Camus and others like him say, just accept that. You'll be better. You'll find what really makes you happy, and then you'll die. You'll love people, and then you'll say goodbye. Just accept the brokenness and the pain of this world. Stop trying to create a heaven that makes you feel better. But I think it's much more than that. Yes, this is a natural world, but so many things in it do not feel natural. And we can't ignore that. Every single one of us groans for something better. And the Bible says that we groan because we're not home. We dream about ultimate things because we're exiles from the place we were created, Eden, heaven. We were created to live in an environment where life lasts, where love lasts, and we are not there, and we grieve it. And the reason why we desire those things is because God planted that in you. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. When we imagine heaven, the reason why it's going to be better is because it's going to be home. And it will be able to sustain and support our deepest desires. Love will last. Love will last. We are built for that world. We are built for a different place. Heaven is better because it's a permanent place. As we just said, God has planted eternity, not temporary, in our hearts. In the Revelation in John, uh, in the Revelation from John here in uh, chapter 21, verse 23, it says, The city doesn't, doesn't need the sun or the moon. For the glory of God will give it light. Now, what do the sun and the moon do? They help govern time, right? We're not going to need those because it's a permanent place. It's a permanent place. It's a permanent home. It's not a temporary place. You and I were built for something that lasts. You are made for more than this natural world. So what is heaven? Well, heaven's a better place. There's no evil there. It's holy. We're not separate from God anymore. We're where God is. It's home. It's the home we were built for and designed for that we long for. And it's permanent. It lasts. So why do we need it? Why do we need it? We need it because it's a place of healing. It's a place of healing. Now, Blaise Pascal in the 17th century uh, was a Christian, uh, a Christian philosopher who was uh, beginning to write, uh, had a conversion, beginning to write in a time where technology and sciences were really, really advancing. And they were promising to deliver a better life. Now, we're a couple hundred years on the other side of that, and it kind of feels like that still, that, like there's all these new sciences and technologies that are being developed that will somehow promise us a much better life, a longer life. We can heal disease. We can, all these kinds of things. And in his writings, he, he, he talks about human beings and human existence, and he talks about how there's this, uh, this contrast that all human beings have the ability to imagine grander or better places and to try to innovate to get there. And it's a gift. It's a human gift. No other thing on this planet has that gift of our ability to imagine a world that's better and try to create it. And at the same time, we have a curse. We can perceive the misery. We can see the brokenness. Every single one of us can imagine something better than we currently have or could possibly have. Perhaps right now, you can imagine for yourself better health. Maybe a better body because your body is starting to fall apart. Maybe you could imagine a world with more money so you can do more things that bring you pleasure. 
Maybe you can imagine better relationships or an improved marriage. Maybe you can imagine a different vocation, one that really brings you meaning. Or, or maybe you could imagine if the, you know, if the governments of the world could just really pull this policy change off, this would be a better place. We are trying to imagine and create a heaven on earth. Why? Because the leaves of the tree that is only found in heaven are for the healing. And we are a world that needs healing. We are individuals that need healing. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. We will be healed. Our spirit will be healed. Gone will be the desire to break command and hurt people. Our, our soul will be sanctified. We'll undergo a process of transformation where we won't even want to sin anymore. And we'll undergo a resurrection or what the Bible calls a glorification. So in other words, when you die, you will be with Jesus, you will be in heaven, and you will have a glorified body. You will experience transformation just like Jesus did. And there will be no more sin, and there will be no more pain, and there will be no more mourning. And what will you experience? You will experience healing. Lasting, true healing. That no doctor is going to be able to put in a pill that you're not going to find in a counseling session. You're only going to find it by trusting in it. Not that those things are bad, but understanding that full and final healing are going to come from God. There's this image where, where you see the Lord wiping the tears away. What an intimate, personal moment of healing that you'll have with your heavenly father. And do you know all the nerve endings that are in your face? And to have the Lord's hand physically touch your face and wipe away your tears, acknowledging the pain and removing all the shame and giving you heaven. What a moment that you're going to have as you're sanctified and glorified. Heaven's a better place because it's a fulfilling place. It's a fulfilling place. There's a lot of fulfilling things that happen on this earth, but nothing like what you're going to see in heaven. And I'm going to give you four happenings that will happen. There's more things, but just here's four things to think about that will happen in heaven that will make it fulfilling. And the first one is I'm going to call it rank. Okay, rank. So for the first time in your whole life, you will rank what's most important as actually most important. Who's most important will actually be most important. Now, there's a great book written by C.S. Lewis. It's called The Great Divorce. It's, uh, it's uh, about a, uh, a bus ride to hell, basically. And they get out and they walk around, and you're kind of eavesdropping on conversations that uh, spirits from heaven are having with ghosts who are in hell. And they're trying to persuade these ghosts to go to heaven. Like, here's all you have to do to go to heaven. And there's one particular woman, and their conversation is just so striking. But in the conversation, you, you hear about her wondering about, where's Michael? Where's Michael? I need Michael. Where's Michael? Where's Michael? Well, Michael was her son, and she loved him. And he was her world. And we learned that he died at a young age. And so here she is, trying to find Michael, her love, her, her love, her love, her love. And this, this spirit from heaven is there talking to her, trying to convince her to leave hell. And she's like, well, well how do I do that? And, 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 and what we unpack in the story is that, is that she only wants to know, the only thing she wants to know about heaven is, is Michael there? Nothing about God, nothing about that relationship, nothing about any of that. And so in the conversation, the, the spirit from heaven is saying, hey, um, here's what's happening. Is as you're ranking this relationship over the source 
of all relationships. You're ranking what, what you've been given over the one who gave. And, and he says, you're treating God only as a means to my goals. God is just a means to pleasure for you, a means to eternity, a means to what you really want. But you cannot love another creature fully, C.S. Lewis writes, till you learn to love God. Part of the desire of heaven is understanding, I'm going to get that right. I'm going to love God more than another person, another thing, another place. And I'm going to want him more. And that part of me that's been broken is going to be fixed. He's the only thing that will ever satisfy you and me, which is why, which is why we're never satisfied. Because we don't have him. We don't have him. Heaven will be fulfilling because our cosmic thirst for unfailing love, which is only through God, will finally be quenched. Now, another thing that's going to happen in heaven is reunion. Reunion. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, And then there will be one huge family reunion with the Master. So, so we're going to be with the Lord, and we're going to love Him, and our love for Him is going to be ranked in the right order. But then... There's going to be a reunion with all of God's people and all the people that we love, and it's going to last forever. And I'm not talking about the boring family reunion that you went to as a kid that you hoped would end. I'm talking about the best, you know. This is like vaca family vacation is what's happening, you know. We're promised a reunion. Another thing that's going to happen in heaven is we're going to reign forever and ever. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. In heaven, it's not going to be boring. What are you going to be doing? You're going to be reigning. Doesn't that sound awesome? You are going to reign. So you're trying to reign now. You're trying to be God now. You're trying to bring yourself pleasure now. But in heaven, when all those relationships are fixed, you are truly going to reign you're going to serve him, and it's going to bring you joy. You're going to eat, and you're going to work, and you do amazing projects. You're going to reign. You've never been satisfied like you will be satisfied when you're reigning with the Lord forever and ever in the home you were built for that you never had, that you were separated from. And finally, you're going to be rewarded. Matthew 25, 21 says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. I'm not exactly sure, but the Bible in several places seems to indicate that we will be rewarded in tangible ways for our faithfulness in this life. And so everything you do, everything you say, everything you build, everything you're after in this world, it's not wasted. Rather, it's factored into your heavenly experience. I don't know how all that works, but I know what that text says. I'll set you over much. Come into my joy based upon your goodness and your faithfulness now. So heaven is a better place because there's no evil there. It's a better place because it's holy. It's not separate from God. It's a better place because it's the home you were built for. It's a better place because it's permanent. It's going to last. It's a better place because, because you need healing and only God can wipe away the tear from your eye. And it's a better place because it's the, only, it's the only place through him that you're going to find total fulfillment. That's why we need it. It's the only place for healing. It's the only place for fulfillment. So how do we get there? Heaven's a better place because it's a reserved place. Verse 27 of Revelation 21 says, But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be there. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? How do you get it written in there? Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says, Even before he made the world, think about that, before God created, God loved us. Before you existed, before anything existed, he loved us. And he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us 
into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. God wants all people to experience real fulfillment, real pleasure through him for eternity in heaven. So heaven is a better place. It's a better place for those who are in God's family by faith in Jesus and will live in the full presence of God forever. That's what heaven is. And all of us want to go there. How do we go there? Let me read you a story that Jesus told trying to stir the Pharisees to exchange their you know, works-based religiousness and pushing away sinners. He tells this story, and it's amazing. Luke 14, verse 15 and following says, one of, one of those at the table with him heard this. He said to them, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is an analogy for heaven. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. It's going to be so fulfilling. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. It's going to be the best use of my time, I'm sorry. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner, who we're to understand is God in the story, the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still Room. Then the, ma the master told the servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. Why? So that my house will be full. I tell you that not one of those who were invited and made an excuse or looked for fulfillment in some other tract or some other idea will get a taste of my banquet. They might get a foretaste in this life, but they're missing the primary course, which is me. How do you go to heaven? Well, the first thing is you don't cover up the longing. You have eternity planted in your heart. You were built for a world that lasts. You were built to be satisfied and sustained by the love of the creator God and nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. There's, there's no activity, there's no relationship, there's no amount of money, there's no profession that will ever, ever, ever sustain and fulfill you except for your creator who loved you before he made the world. And he wants to give you heaven. Don't be foolish to think that you're going to get heaven through some other relationship or activity. It's only going to come only going to come and the one who creates and the one who created you and after you've done that not covered up the longing because it's in there you think about it you think about eternity what do you need to do you need to accept the invitation the invitation of the cross you have a cosmic thirst that nothing in this world will satisfy and God sent Jesus Christ, the Lamb, to bear the weight of our sin, what caused the separation, what broke creation. And he went to a cross. And on the cross, Jesus at one point said, I thirst. He's experiencing the cosmic thirst that you've experienced since you've been here, trying to fill yourself, trying to find happiness, trying to find the thing that sustains, trying to find it in a relationship, and yet God 
in Jesus Christ takes your thirst. Did, did, did you notice in, in, in verse 6 of Revelation 21, it says, To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. It's without cost. He's inviting you to a great banquet where you will experience the most satisfaction, the most pleasure that you'll ever have. And you can only receive it when you understand the cross, that God himself experienced the brokenness of this world and sin so he could give you heaven. So you would say yes to his invitation to spend eternity with him. Finally, if you've done that, Wait for your reservation to be called. Because there's going to become a day when you pass from this earth and you'll see the face of God. And it'll be the most satisfying, thrilling moment because you will be in the presence of selflessness, of love, of everything this world doesn't have. And he wants to give it to you. And so even though many of us have to deal with the, the curse of this world, the pains of this world, the sicknesses in this world, listen to what Paul writes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Christ and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if, we, that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. When we imagine heaven, when we think about the place we were built for, as we're waiting for the reservation, the weight of thinking about that place outweighs the current pain we're going through because he's with us and he's invited you and he wants to give you heaven. And everyone can go to heaven when they accept the invitation from Jesus. It's only through faith and what Jesus has done. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you speak honestly to us. You tell us what our condition is, and you step into that condition, and you bear the weight of our sin and separation to heal our souls, to, to glorify us one day in heaven. And now we even get a, a foretaste because we know your love and we see it so clearly in Jesus Christ. We want to be like you. We want to serve you. We want to reign with you. Thank you for the hope of heaven, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, would you stand? Let's sing. Let's go.
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. As Jesus is sitting with his disciples in the upper room, showing them what they are to do to remember and to celebrate until he comes again by, by taking a, a cup and by taking bread, remembering his body, remembering his blood. There's, there's actually a few cups there as part of the Passover meal. And the last cup, Jesus says, I'm not going to drink this cup. I'll drink this when we're together. When I come back and we're together, we will drink this together. And so not only during this time of communion do we remember what Jesus has done for us, the fact that he has saved us, that those who have placed their hope and their trust and their faith in Jesus have that forgiveness. Not only is it that, but it 
is also anticipating and waiting, waiting for his return. It says that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns again. There's this aspect of heaven, of eternal life, that we'll do this together. We wait for that. So as we take this time of communion, I'm going to give you just a quiet moment. You can pray. You can take the communion whenever you're ready. But think about those things. Think about the forgiveness. Think about the salvation of Jesus, but also the hope of doing this together. the world that you would spend part of your Sunday morning on a heaven-like day uh, today. So hope you enjoy the rest of your day. We want to see you back next week. We're going to finish up the series. Everything we've done so far is leading up to the conclusion next week. So please, please, please be back here. Maybe bring a friend next week. Hey, if you're new or newer to First Christian, thank you for coming. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation. If you haven't turned in a connection card, we'd love to catch your name. Turn it in the connection point. On your way out, we got a gift for you as well. Thanks for spending some time with us. Hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you back here soon.